Today I'm going to go through some of the lesser discussed reasons for living overseas. Things that my friends and I have recently been discussing. Things that you may not have thought about as a benefit of living in a smaller country that has lower taxes, beyond the tax savings, beyond the weather, beyond the lifestyle. I'm going to share some of those with you today. So this all started with a conversation. I have a friend who lives in South America and his friends back in Canada constantly say, aren't you unsafe down there? And he's pretty much given up convincing them because it's a certain point, it's not our job to convince other people. If you'd like to go where you're treated best you can, for him, he likes living in South America. And he's created a very favorable tax situation. He has great weather. He's got a great you know, social environment. He's very happy down there. And so what he mentioned to me though, was in light of the, the current geopolitical situation, Countries in South America aren't trying to start a world war, or they're not playing geopolitical games, however you want to look at it. Uh, you can be just as safe in these countries as you would be in Canada or the United States or anywhere else. In fact, in some cases, it's actually better. You can save a lot of money in the process, and your life will probably be a lot happier detaching from all the things that are causing you to question whether any other country besides yours is actually worth living in. Because I can tell you, out of 252 countries and territories, there are probably plenty of places where you could be very happy living, reducing your taxes, increasing your freedom, bettering your lifestyle, and avoiding the next world war. I'm Andrew Henderson. I'm the founder of Nomad Capitalist. Over the last decade, we've helped over a thousand high and ultra high net worth individuals from entrepreneurs to investors legally reduce their taxes overseas, increase their freedom with dual citizenship and grow their opportunities in all the countries that there are to choose from. You can learn more at nomadcapitalist.com. And so I'm going to walk you through why I left my home country, in my case, the United States, uh, go against some conventional wisdom that you may have heard and then talk about the reality of what it's like to live overseas. And these are the things that I've been thinking about why I choose to live overseas. I grew up in the United States. I got into politics at a very early age, but I realized at a certain point as a young entrepreneur in my 20s that I'm paying a lot of money for a culture that doesn't really value what I'm doing to the extent it once did. Uh, the opportunities are getting smaller. They're taking more of my money. That's only going to get worse in the coming years. I didn't like the, tox the growing toxicity of the culture. I think it's much worse since I left, actually, and I kind of saw that coming. I didn't like the politics. I didn't like this idea that if you want lower taxes, you've got to vote for some guy, and then you hope he gets in, and if enough of them get in, they're going to lower your taxes, or if you want lower regulations, or if you want whatever. Right? I just thought that the, the government was very heavy-handed, and to the point of... You know, if you live in a Western country that's involved in all these geopolitical issues around the world, either causing them, responding to them, sticking their nose into them, where you live could be a target. I'm not saying that I ever lived in fear of that in the United States, but I didn't like the politics. I didn't like traveling the world as an American. I didn't like showing my U.S. passport. Really, taxes really never played into my decision to want to leave. I wanted to see other cultures. I wanted to see the opportunities that were emerging in the world, and I just wanted to be from a country that I thought was really heading in the wrong direction. The U.S. certainly does have a small core of winners, and that's what has made it a successful country. I think it will become less and less of that in the years to come for a number of cultural and social factors. Uh, but the culture generally, to me, in the U.S., outside of that core uh, circle of winners, is just a bad culture. I didn't think I'd fit in. And as a bonus, when I figured out, hey, I don't want to live here anymore, I started researching why I was paying so much in taxes. I'm like, okay, what happens if I move to another country? What happens with my taxes? And the answer is, if you're an American, you will have to file taxes and report your foreign bank accounts and report your, cor your foreign corporations no matter where you go. But you can still dramatically reduce, if not eliminate, the taxes that you pay, especially if you're an entrepreneur. And so even though the U.S. makes it more of a hassle, you can still reduce that. Anybody else, there's a procedure you can go through and just get out of the tax net, and then you can do what you want. That's what we help people do at Nomad Capitalist. We do the financial planning, the immigration planning, the lifestyle planning. We ask people hundreds of questions as our client and we create a holistic plan and then we plug people into our network of hundreds of attorneys and accountants and real estate agents and experts all around the world managing those people from a multi-jurisdictional perspective because nobody in any other country probably knows how you have to live your life based on being a U.S. citizen. And so we basically bridge that gap for folks by making sure everyone's singing from the same sheet of music. The conventional wisdom is that where you live in is safe and everything else stinks. And so when I talk to Australians, they think their country is the safest. When I talk to Americans, they think their country is the safest. Australia is safer than the United States. If you look at the US, like murder rates, it's in the, the lower 
a third of countries in the world. The U.S. Virgin Islands, a U.S. territory, has the fourth highest murder rate in the world. Doesn't mean that you will be murdered, but it means that if we're looking at statistics, you can do better. So your country isn't as safe as you think, unless you're living in Liechtenstein or the UAE or Iceland or Georgia or any of the countries that have very, very low crime numbers. And so the conventional wisdom is wrong. Everywhere else doesn't suck. There are plenty of other safe places. Uh, and that includes whether you look at it from violent crime, property crime, health safety, access to health care. Uh, there was one report that said that uh, you know, de uh, maternal deaths, like during, during uh, childbirth, in some parts of Texas are not the same level as Syria. And so if you live in New York City, that may not matter to you. But if you look at the country as a whole, your country isn't the best place to be. The idea that your country is the best that it gets is also conventional wisdom, even when you don't like it. And so I feel like people often defend the country much like they would defend, you know, a bad marriage, for example. Like it's just they don't want to admit that they're in the wrong place. But the reality is it's easier than ever to buy a plane ticket, get immigration to any number of countries that will roll out the welcome mat for you if you've got income, if you've got money to invest, if you have money in the bank, if you've got a business to start. Uh, if you have an ancestor from there, you can get residence or citizenship, you can move there, you can plug yourself into a better tax system. So the reality for me is the following. Why I live overseas is because I understand these things. Number one, that anywhere can be safe, even Colombia. I have a home in Colombia, I spend some time there. I have at one time seen, I've had a threat of having property crime where I'm holding my phone and the guy wanted to take the phone from me. He did not succeed, no violence ensued. Uh, and, you know, I, I relearned the lesson that I already knew, which is don't carry your phone around in Colombia. Uh, can you do that and, and get away with it most of the time? Sure. And can you do it in most other countries and get away with it entirely? Yes. Uh, whenever we have people from our team from Georgia travel other places, they're always walking around, you know, with the phone. They're just always carrying it around because in Georgia, there's like zero property crime. If, if someone, if you leave your phone in a taxi, the taxi driver will find you and return your phone to you. They'll return your laptop. They'll return your camera. We've heard all these stories from folks that we know. So anywhere can be safe. Most places are statistically safer than your country if you're from, let's say, the United States. Again, Canada and Australia are better. But crime in some Western countries is going in the wrong direction. Look at a place like Germany, for example. And again, look at property crime versus violent crime. You can protect better against property crime. You know, if you want to have homes around the world, as I do, uh, maybe you want to have those be apartments where you have some kind of you know, built-in security, where you've got um, you know, better than a house, for example. And so you can protect against that. Violent crime, for me, is the issue. And uh, there's plenty of places in Eastern Europe, uh, the Gulf, East and Southeast Asia, places like Singapore, uh, places like Korea, where you can live much better. And there's plenty of other places where it's just normal. Right? And, and if you're going to live in Bogota, you're going to live in the nice neighborhood the same way you live in the nice neighborhood in Chicago or Sydney or London. You're not going to move to the slums. I mean, if you live in the slums now, maybe you want to live in the slums there. But I would say if you live in the slums in Chicago, you can certainly work your way out of that. Um, for the taxes that you'll save moving to other countries or to, or to another country or to a combination of other countries following my trifecta method where you basically have three different homes, I mean, you could bloody hire a private army if you've got that much to, uh, to take. Uh, and so, I mean, we have people who save half a million, a million, millions, multi-millions of dollars a year. And the beauty of saving taxes when you go overseas is there's not much trial and error. You follow the rules, you set your structures up properly, and the money just comes in as long as you live overseas. And so if you think security is that bad, hire a security guy. I mean, we had one of our speakers come down to the first Nomad Capitalist Live uh, in 2021 down to Playa del Carmen. He said, I, I gotta have security when I travel outside of the US. He realized in two seconds, like I don't have this security. Yeah, I'm just gonna hang around, just you know, leave, me, leave me alone. But if you wanted that security, it's obviously very affordable to hire. You can also stay in your own bubble. If you wanna create your own bubble, I certainly caution against doing this to too much of an extent. I see some people following the herd. They go to Bangkok, they go to Medellin, they go to the same places. Uh, you know, we started talking about Tbilisi, now a bunch of people want to go to Tbilisi. Uh, glad to have that, but I want to make sure you don't create too much of a bubble. But if you need that bubble to feel comfortable, you certainly can do it. And so you've got a bubble where you live. That bubble is probably strangling you. It's probably strangling your potential. You are, your net worth is that, of, you know, the average of, of your five closest friends, your salary or your net worth. Uh, you could go overseas and you could build uh, a more intentional lifestyle that allows you to uh, grow faster. And so I think get out of the bubble. But if you need the bubble, there's expats in plenty of places around the world, and that's the reality. You can dial up and down the cultural richness when you want. And so 
I like living in a place like Malaysia, for example, because I have all the local foods in a multicultural country. Indian food, one of the best cuisines in the world. I go to my little hole in the wall Indian place that I've been going to for a decade. They know me, it's fantastic. And yet if I wanna go and have a Five Guys hamburger and a milkshake, I can also do that. If I wanna go to uh, Nobu, if I wanna go to a steakhouse overlooking the Petronas Towers, I mean, I've got the ability to dial it up and down. I can also eat in the street. And so I can figure out how much time I wanna spend with locals. And so I'm a, I'm a member of a club where it is largely locals. They are more upscale locals. Uh, I can go there but I can also do things that I'm used to doing. And so if you want expats around you, you get, to, you get to control that. You don't get that where you live because everyone where you live is like you, has the same perspectives. There's no cultural friction to help you improve, to help you find new opportunities, to help you uh, discover more about yourself. But if you want the bubble, you can have it. Uh, one of the other reasons I like though living overseas is you get to watch the world unfolding before your eyes. And my thesis is if we're planning for the next 100 years, where is it I want to invest? Where is it I want to be a citizen? Where is it I'm, I'm, I want my money to be stored? Where do I want my kids to work? The answer is probably somewhere different than where you are right now, if you're being honest with yourself in terms of where the world economy is gonna go. And so by living overseas and living in different countries and by traveling to different countries, maybe you live and you follow my global citizen sandwich where you store your assets in Singapore, live in Malaysia, and then you spend occasional business trips uh, you know, checking out opportunities that you invested in Cambodia, India, Indonesia, Vietnam, what have you. And so, you know, what Jim Rogers, when we interviewed him, the adventure capitalist, great book, you know, he wanted to live in Singapore because he believes the 21st century will belong to Asia and better to watch it unfold in front of your eyes, better to be close to it, better to be connected to it. That's a certain thing that's hard to replicate with a Zoom call. If you are a really frontier investor and you really want to build a tremendous growth business, we've had a few folks over the years who build businesses in Africa. They're making huge returns. Same thing in maybe some frontier Asian markets, huge returns. If you want to be an investor, you get in early, you can do very well. But you have to, to a certain extent, be there to watch it unfold. You also, by living overseas, determine the freedoms that you value. And I think a lot of folks are afraid to move because how will I homeschool? The answer is the same way you homeschool now. Where will I get medical care? The medical care will be better and it'll be cheaper. And it'll be more caring. You know, where do I have certain social liberties? you get to determine the freedoms that you value. And so there's folks uh, this year when Roe v. Wade was overturned in the U.S., people that don't agree with that. Great, there's countries in Europe that respect that. There's people who uh, you know, are looking for greater gay rights. There's countries that respect that. There's also countries that are very conservative for, for folks who want that. There's countries that allow homeschooling and countries that don't. But imagine that you're a citizen of a country like uh, Germany where they frown on homeschooling. They don't want you to do it. Is that a good thing or a bad thing if you want to homeschool? You don't have the freedom, right? What kind of medical care do you want? You know, figure out where what you have is available. And so for me, at 38 years old, I get health checkups. I like to be, you know, have health care available to me, uh, but I'm not doing intense medical procedures. And so while I live in places, especially Malaysia, where there's excellent health care, I don't build my entire life around it. But if I did want to build my entire life around that, then yeah, I probably would not be going and living in Ecuador. I wouldn't be spending my time in Georgia unless I just thought I was going to fly to Istanbul or Dubai whenever I needed something. But if I thought I needed emergency care, I wouldn't live in that kind of place, perhaps. Not that people don't get emergency care there, but if I want the best, sure, I'm not going to live in some up and coming places. Uh, but I will live in places that have an established quality of care. I would live if I want to homeschool in a country like Georgia, which is open to homeschooling. Many countries in emerging parts of the world are open to homeschooling, and you can hire tutors, either from that country or from some other country, and get them a residence permit. They can move there, right? So you get to choose what's important to you. And then to the point of my friend, you get to stay out of the blast radius. I do think if you're building the ultimate plan B as a wealthy person, I see wealthy folks you know, buying bunkers in places like the US. The better thing to me would be to have residents in Uruguay, uh, residents in Paraguay, residents in Mauritius, uh, residents in some place that's affordable. I think there's probably a lot of better deals than New Zealand, which is kind of the billionaire's choice, the bunker choice. Uh, but you can find more affordable versions of that in the Southern Hemisphere, in places that are far away. Um, certainly, you know, a Caribbean island where you can get citizenship by investment is probably not taking off a lot of other people geopolitically. But if you want to be even further away from, let's say, you know, Western sphere of influence, if you want to be away from the world wars, why not have some kind of residence? And if you can work that towards citizenship, do that. 
right? You could get citizenship by investment in Vanuatu, not a great passport, but if you want to be in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, you know, far away from it all, I guess not so far if you're from Australia and New Zealand, but far away from everything else, uh, you know, that could be, that's a place that has remained relatively neutral. Uh, they're not getting entangled in some of the, the craziness in the world. Having a citizenship there means you can always get in, right? And it also means you can fly through Australia or New Zealand, uh, even if you would otherwise need a visa to go back to your country. Wouldn't it be the worst thing to have in your back pocket, some kind of access to a place that's out of the blast radius and certainly a place that you know, minds its own business. Those places are smaller countries. They're in the Southern Hemisphere to some extent. And so uh, that's something that you can set up now, even if you don't want to move overseas. But I think that once you start building your offshore banking, once you start getting your residences and citizenships, even if you just plan on having those as what I would call infrastructure to not move, you're going to start being curious about what you're missing out on by not spending at least part of your time overseas. And when you live overseas, you're going to realize that there's a lot of opportunities that's going to help you grow as a person. It's going to help you grow your wealth, grow your business, and uh, it's really a great way to live.